Welcome to The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. I'm Doug Adams. And I'm Kirk McElhern. Hello, and thanks for joining us today, everybody. This is episode number 97 of The Next Track, and it's being brought to you by Audible. Our Next Track listeners can get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial just by visiting audibletrial.com slash next track. You can choose from over 180,000 audiobook titles at Audible that can be played on your iPhone, any Android device, Kindle, or any MP3 player. Today we welcome Jerry Ewing as our guest. He is the founder and current editor of Prague, the UK magazine dedicated to progressive rock, old and new. Jerry, thanks for joining us. It's great to meet you. Great to meet you guys. I'm fulfilling a lifelong dream appearing on this podcast with you. <laughs> you must have had a short life, Jerry, but it's great to meet you. Jerry just released a, a really beautiful book called Wondrous Stories, A Journey Through the Landscape of Progressive Rock. And this is, this is really a nice book. It's like those Dorling Kindersley books with text and lots of pictures. You have pictures of the musicians and the albums, and you cover more or less the history of progressive rock from before we called it progressive rock to the present so let's start with your first chapter. Can you just sum up what is progressive rock? And this is the big question, isn't it? <laughs> well, so I, think, I think it's why I start the book, How Long Have You Got? Um, everybody has their own take on, on what progressive rock is. Um, and I think I quote a couple of people, you know, Ian Anderson, music for people to get bored easily, <laughs> awkward music for awkward people. Uh, it's a good one. Um, Steve Hackett in the forward to the book says it's music without boundaries. I really like that. Um, Steve Wilson says it's it's music where the artist takes the album as a format and uses it to take the listener on a journey. I really like that. Somebody posted on the Prog Magazine Readers Group on Facebook the other day asking people, you know, the, the never ending question. What is your take on it? And I think my response there was it, it's it's um, music, the creation of music and a sound that goes beyond the confines of expected popular music. I mean, there's a myriad of, of different um, descriptions you can use. And especially because once we got into the early 70s, this was used as a marketing label to pigeonhole bands. Well, I think the first, I think, now what I think you first started to see was on albums like Deep Purple's second, third, fourth albums before Ian Gillen joined the band, but not Shades of Deep Purple. So Deep Purple, Book of Talese, and that kind of thing. Um, on the back, it would have File Under, Progressive, which was a gate for record stores. Um, and I think, yeah, you see on things like uh, Quatermass and lot, you know, if you find original early 70s vinyl, it sometimes has on the back file under progressive. Um, and I think that's got something to do with it. Then I think it's the no boundaries aspect of it. Um, that, you know, because the, the, what makes it's restless music, but it's in, it's also incessantly inquisitive. Um, and through that, it's creative. Um, I mean, I, to me, to me, progressive is is more of a state of mind about how you go about creating your music rather than the sound, because it's such a broad. The music has such a broad scope. So what it isn't <laughs> is music that sounds like Yes recorded it in 1974. That is a very small part of it. But, you know, we do, you, you have a, a section of the audience, and for them, that's it, and nothing else can beat prog. Well, it's a good point, and we, we had Dave Weigel on a few months, who, who recently wrote a book about progressive rock, and what, what's interesting is to compare his book, he's an American, with your book, who, who's British, who saw different aspects of progressive rock as well. In the States, Doug and I, we were on the front line for this. I, I saw all the big prog rock bands. I was a huge fan of Yes and ELP and all that. But for us, this kind of came as a sort of a, a, a sudden surge of a number of bands that just kind of faded away after 1978. There wasn't really the same continuity that you've had in the UK over time. And you link it even to early records like the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds and the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper. Well, I, I link it there because I think that those were the records, as long with Frank Zappa's uh, The Mothers of Inventions Freak Out as being that these were the gateways that let musicians understand that they could do whatever they wanted 
you know, I mean, because if you on paper, if you look at some of what the, the early progressive bands were doing, they were taking classical music and jazz music and, and, and folk and mixing it together. Now, on paper, or if you went to a musicologist, they go, you can't do that. But they did it. And that's what makes progressive music so unique and so exciting and equally challenging. Um, but I think none of those people would have. Or, I mean, I guess someone would have stumbled across it eventually. My point is that those groundbreaking albums as you know that they, they made the music industry shift from thinking it was all about the hit single to oh the album is actually a creative work of art in itself and that along with drug taking which was rife obviously you know uh a Everything had grown out of the, the psychedelic boom in the 60s. Yeah, and as a, a longtime fan of the Grateful Dead, I've always wondered why the Grateful Dead weren't considered to be progressive rock, because they were, in their in their freeform jamming, they were more progressive than most rock bands. Uh, it's a snobbery thing, I think. Uh, We've long yeah. been trying to get them in the magazine for the Outer Limits section, because we think that there's an aspect of progressive music to what they do. But I think because they come from a jug band blues sort of background, there's a lot of snobbery from prog fans who go, well, they can't be. Look at what they came from. That's got nothing to do with the music that I like. So, I mean, it's an opening of the mind, uh, an expanding of the mind in terms of, of sense, you know, your senses. That's where drugs came in. And, you know, somebody going, actually, I can do what I've been thinking about because, you know, listen to what, Brian Wilson's done with Pet Sounds. Look at what Lennon and McCartney are doing with Sgt. Pepper. You know, I mean, and that's 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 why I, I cite those albums as being hugely important to the development of progressive rock. Well, so one thing you mentioned earlier was the, the importance of classical and folk music. And it's kind of interesting that there is this classical influence and, you know, Steve Howe played classical music and Keith Emerson and it's sort of rooted in a in a British musical tradition that, that we don't have in the States, this this choral tradition, this church tradition. And, you know, I remember the first time I heard ELP's song Jerusalem on Brain Salad Surgery. I was like, never heard this song. It's pretty neat. Sounds kind of like a hymn. But, you know, and it turns out it's like the most important hymn in all of um, the Church of England. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, Ian Anson's another one, Jeff Downs, these go Chris Squire, um, you Rick know, Wakeman. Greg Lake, Wakeman. I mean, for a lot of these guys, you know, it was being in church choirs. You know, they, they were dragged along to church by their parents because, you know, back then it was a societal norm to go along. And that sort of, that, you know, you speak to Jeff Downs, he'll say, well, that actually is what fired my initial interest in music. And that's why you've got, uh, one, you've got a big classical tradition with, uh, with, with progressive music. Keith Emerson, you know, we said, you know, with the nice, all I, I wanted to do was take classical and mix it with rock, and he took it to the nth degree with Emerson, Lake and Palmer. It's also why so many prog bands have big Christmas hits, or, have, you know, um, you can just write the old Christmas album, Greg Lake, I believe in Christmas. There's this intrinsic link, not not with organised religion, but with, with the fact that, that their musical roots, you know, a lot of them are linked... Uh, to to have being in church and hearing that kind of sound. What, one of the elements that made progressive rock become hugely popular is probably in the U.S. Uh, you may have seen there was a documentary on the BBC a couple of years ago about did they call it the Second British Invasion? And I think there were three parts, and the second part was about bands, particularly Led Zeppelin, who came to the states and started playing in arenas. And this was before arena concerts were common. And all these arenas all of a sudden wanted to have bands who could fill the arenas who could play concerts because it was so it was so beneficial for them financially. Yeah, I saw that. Um, and I was very pleased to see Jethro Tull and Yes included in there. And of course, I mean, Tull got, got big in America quite quickly. And they actually took Yes on tour with them. And that helped break Yes in America. And, you know, you look at it, the likes of Yes and, and Tull and Emerson, Lake and Palmer, they broke big in America a lot, a lot quicker than Genesis and Pink Floyd, who would ultimately overshadow everybody in terms of sales and, and the kind of concerts they would play. Um, you know, and, and that, you know, it was a key thing. I mean, yes, this weekend, it's their 50th anniversary. I'm, I'm comparing a fan day at the Palladium on the Sunday before the gig. And they admit that, you know, if, if Tull hadn't taken them to America and then a, a, a DJ hadn't picked up on Roundabout as a single, then perhaps it, was, it would have been slightly different. But, you know, that's that's what happened, and that's that's kind of 
why those bands sort of were your early forebears of arena rock. And were also the the key bands of progressive rock. And, and you have a section in your book, you talk about the big six, which you name as Pink Floyd, Genesis, yes, King Crimson, Jethro Tull, and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I was fortunate enough to see all of those bands, not necessarily during the key prog rock periods. I only saw Pink Floyd when they did The Wall. But Doug and I were discussing last week about this. I never considered King Crimson to be a progressive rock band. I considered them to be a jazz rock band. And I was saying to Doug the other day, for me, the key element of progressive rock is bombast. And that's something that King Crimson never had. It's, it's not it's not bombast. It's it's light and shade. And, and I, I disagree with you. I think King Crimson have plenty of bombastic moments. You only have to listen to the Red album um, to hear it. But I'm not talking about the music. I'm talking about the shows. Oh, you right. know, Peter Gabriel with his costumes and Rick Wakeman with his his capes and all that. And and you compare that to, to Robert Fripp sitting on a chair. With King Crimson, it's the intense musicality, you know, that, that, that put, puts them into, you know, um, and, and only one or two of their uh, their albums veer towards jazz. A, a, you know, I mean, in the court of the Crimson King arrived, as I think perhaps the first fully fledged progressive, not the first progressive album, the first complete, compact, here you go, this is a perfect, if you had to say to someone, you know, one album defines progressive rock. I'd possibly go for In the Court of the Crimson King. I just think that arrived and it was like, this This is really pointing the way to go, where the likes of uh, Pink Floyd and uh, the Moody Blues and Procol Harum were sort of in, were exploring still and, and Caravan, you know, uh, and Crimson arrived and went, bang, here you go, this is how you do it. But then the next album was so different and then the next album was different and the personnel changed and of course this is one of the elements of this 1970s progressive rock that the personnel was constantly changing yeah um and, and it, i mean it's that's that's a, a factor of, of of progressive music i think from from day one to now um you know but uh but it's you see, you see it's that musical restlessness again that that, that you know and, and inquisitiveness that that, that that very much sticks crimson in you know, in, in the progressive realm. We're going to take a short break here and be back in a minute with our guest Jerry Ewing and more talk about progressive rock. A couple of weeks ago, we were delighted to have audiobook narrator Simon Vance on the show, remember? And I've been listening to his read of The Complete Sherlock Holmes. It's just great. He's a great reader. Where did I get it? From Audible. In fact, that's just one of over 180,000 audiobook titles available at Audible. And because you are a Next Track listener, we're going to turn you on to a free audiobook and a free 30 day trial of Audible. Here's what you do you remember this URL audibletrial.com slash next track. Then use it to get a free audiobook. I had a look the other day and I'm thinking about picking up Ready Player One by Ernest Klein, and it's narrated by Will Wheaton. Another Audible book I'm thinking of getting is Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm so in a hurry, the audiobook version is the only way I'm going to crack that one. A free audiobook download and free 30-day trial is waiting for you at Audible. Check it out by going to audibletrial.com slash next track. I'm really enjoying audiobooks again, and I know you will too. Go to audibletrial.com slash next track. Get your free audiobook and start your free 30-day trial today. Our guest is Jerry Ewing, the editor of UK magazine Prague and the author of the new book, Wondrous Stories, A Journey Through the Landscape of Progressive Rock. You cover a very broad church here in what you consider progressive rock. And part of this is because you do edit a magazine that covers progressive rock from yesterday to today to tomorrow. But it's good to see some of the things you put in, like Miles Davis. I mean, Bitches Brew, to me, is just pure progressive rock. Well, yeah, I mean, as yeah, Return to Forever of Romantic Warrior is a, is a great one. Yeah. You speak to those guys now. We've got Aldo Miola in the next issue, uh, an interview with Aldo Miola, who's obviously in Return to Forever. And he says, we thought we were rock musicians. And and that's something that kind of we, you know, the magazine's been fortunate enough to interview, you know, along with others, John McLaughlin several times, Billy Cobham, Stanley Clark. Al Demiola several times, um, you know, these guys, because we see jazz fusion as being part, it's, it's not progressive rock, but it's, it's a sort of subgenre that, 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 that impacts on the music as a whole. I remember when I was getting into prog, which was in the eighties, um, and, you know, we'd hang out with, with guys in IQ and, and Pendragon and, and 12th night and things like that. 
And these guys would talk about the likes of Chick Career and things like that being huge influences on them. And, and that's where you see that, that, that jazz fusion, which isn't jazz, it's a rock form of jazz, and rock kind of connect. I, th I think the original definition that you had that I really like, and I agree with you, is that it's pushing the boundaries. Really, all you're doing is you're progressing to the next thing. And a lot of people don't feel that that's a good thing to do. I mean, pop stars, of course, want to stay nice and safe. But uh, Prague wanted to, to, to just go beyond the boundary. And I think Jazz Fusion is a great example of that as well, it's sort of, which sort of grew parallel. I think you're right. Jazz Fusion, I think, is perhaps the, the ultimate uh, expression of that. And it's interesting that, that really by the end of the 70s, Jazz Fusion had pretty much blown itself out. It came and went very quickly in, in the same way that punk rock did. Because, um, you know, it was quite an extreme example of, of the, I'm not, obviously I'm not talking about, this is the same punks for anything to do with prog in that sense. I'm just saying that, you know, it was a very, uh, you know, it was, it was quite extreme in, in what it did. Um, it obviously, it pissed off all the jazz purists. <laughs> you know, I guess there's a lot of rock guys that, that can't stomach it because it came, it came from a, a sort of jazz direction. But the people who got it, you know, got it. And because they usually weren't vocals and there were long jams and, you know, it could be quite raucous. It's interesting, though, you came to, to progressive rock in the 80s, whereas Doug and I were a little bit older than you, and, and we were really the groundlings of this period. So for, for me in New York in particular, progressive rock sort of came around 1972. That was my first year of high school. And by 1978, when punk came in, when people were hearing The Clash and Talking Heads, progressive rock just went it just fizzled and kind of disappeared for us. Or did it? Or was it because the media just ignored it? No, it was because people didn't listen to it anymore. It just wasn't cool. We stopped going to see Yes or ELP, and we went to see Talking Heads and, you know, the Ramones. Well, you know, Talking Heads, you can think that, that's extreme art rock. I mean, you know, at some point there's, there's connections there. And, um, no, less so the Ramones. Over here, the media just stopped writing about it. It was a bunch of old farts. Um yeah. It didn't stop any of those bands. I mean, ELP uh, sort of reaching a nadir anyway at that point. But it's interesting to note that, you know, um, they all carried on. And then, you know, slowly there was a resurgence of interest in the 80s. Um, and some of those bands were sort of still around. And then it kind of, the, the 90s wasn't the greatest decade for progressive music. But you know, out of which, you know, prog metal started to develop in America and that kind of kick-started another interest, which by the time you've got to the new millennium, you know, bands are starting to become interested in, in making more interesting music. And it slowly built to about 2008 when I was like thinking I'd, I'd launched Classic Rock magazine in 1998. So, and I'd gone to the, the uh, Classic Rock Awards in in. 2008 and it just got my mind going what have you done in the last decade I don't know I think I've done stuff but nothing quite like classic rock and I just kept on I just got restless and thinking you know maybe I should be doing something maybe I should be doing something and every idea I had came back to progressive rock because there was something happening it was very evident to me and fortunately the, the, the people with the money the guys in the suits they could see it as well I mean you have to bear in mind there was a recession on in the middle of a recession when Prog Magazine launched. So, you know, they had to have quite strong belief. Even if they had no idea what the music was about um, or even liked it, they, 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 were, they were astute enough to be aware that there was something happening. Um, and then we've seen a, a huge resurgence of interest in, you take Genesis and Pink Floyd out of the equation because the amount of records they've sold are just so phenomenal. I mean, it's a quarter, over a quarter of a billion for Pink Floyd. And it's coming up to 180 million for Genesis, which overshadows all the others. The others have sold lots and lots of records, but that, I mean, that's stratospheric. You see, you've seen Caravan come back as quite a creative force, which, I mean, you know, and a lot of these bands either were still going and now they've got a bigger audience, um, or some of them got back together. Um, and, and I think that's a good thing. On, on the whole, you know, some have cynically got back together just because there's a bit of an interest, but the ones you can pick out pretty quickly and i mean van de graaf generator reformed before the magazine even launched and they're still going you know relatively strongly for a band for a group of men of their age um you know and i think it's great to see going back you said every you know people stop listening in in america well over here i guess the music press is slightly different um and because there are fewer outlets for people to hear any form of rock music radio you know the national bbc 
had a very much an anti-rock bias, still have, and there was no MTV, and therefore the only place you could find out about music was in the music press. So you had four weekly music magazines, national music magazines, Sounds, NME, Melody Maker, and Record Mirror. And I mean, you know, Melody Maker started out as a champion of progressive rock. And by the time they, they were, well, we're not interested in that anymore. Sounds was still championing that kind of heavy metal and, and more, you know, Sounds was a huge champion of the like the Marillion boom in the 80s, you know, and then Kerrang! launched on the back of that, which was a heavy metal magazine, but that too covered sort of progressive music. So you had outlets for music fans over here. Um, obviously, prog magazines taken that to the nth degree. But where you guys say that, you know, you, everyone stopped listening to it. Well, I guess nobody was even writing about it in America, but there was still some kind of thing going on in the UK. I did a fanzine when I was at school about progressive music. And, it, you know, there were about three or four fanzines that would did pretty well. And that was before the internet. When I said that the 90s was a terrible decade for, for prog, what it had done was it, it kind of battened down its hatches and went, all right, but we've still got a community. And they were very early adopters of the internet and, and forums and news groups to keep connected. From that, bands like IQ and Pendragon built their little cottage industry record labels just to release their product, which now, of course, have blossomed. From that, then Marillion came up with the idea, which eventually became Pledge Music, all because there was uh, some kind of uh, outlet for people to still keep tabs on the music, which you didn't have in America. Well, one thing we did have in the States and still do is a, a wider range of radio. And as you say, the BBC back then was state run. I mean, Doug, when you were on college radio, you were always looking for new stuff to play, weren't you? I would say that in the 70s and the 80s, yes, that was true. But as I got to uh, become a professional and radio stations became much more tightly formatted, some of the more peripheral sort of music, like progressive rock, was kind of pushed aside. And also, you talk about how, how Genesis has sold so many records. I'll bet a lot of those records are a lot of their pop-oriented records from later, you know? And that's the kind of music that, that, that the radio stations that I worked at played, Invisible Touch and, and things like that, um, rather than the early, you know, wind and weathering stuff. No, no I agree with you there. That's, that's fine. But, um, but they still sold that many albums and they still see themselves as part of the whole progressive thing. Um, sure. Yeah, the, I mean, obviously, you know, we didn't have to worry too much about radio formatting in the UK. They didn't bother playing good music anyway. But radio, I mean, formatting and targeting demographics has completely destroyed any kind of listenable radio or on a commercial level. And, you know, I mean, and of course, progressive music, it was great for FM radio in America. I mean, I, I was in Canada in the early 80s, and FM radio was absolutely amazing. So in your book, you have a, a number of uh, albums that define Prague. And one of the ones that surprised me was that you picked Aqualung by Jethro Tull instead of Thick as a Brick. Now, two things. First, I, I'm always skeptical when Ian Anderson says that Thick as a Brick was meant as a joke, because musically, that is probably one of the most progressive records of the period. I mean, when you listen to the changes to the... To the to the the movement of the themes throughout that, particularly the first side, a little bit less the second side. It really is a musical masterpiece. Lyrically, it obviously is a Monty Python type joke. But I, I always felt that Aqualung was a great song album, but then Thick as a Brick was really the sort of statement album. Perhaps I think I chose Aqualung because it's probably better known. And also there is the element, as you said, that Anderson had his tongue in cheek to a certain extent on Thick as a Brick. But I think you're missing the point with Ian. I mean, lyrically, it's because it's he, he did it because everyone said Aqualung was conceptual, which it wasn't. But there are some songs about organized religion that could be linked. Right. So he went, right, I'll give you a comp. But he meant that lyrically. I don't think he meant it musically because there's no real connection to a concept album and sort of music it should be they're obviously the, the idea of the concept album is strongly linked with progressive music but you know loads of bands do concept albums i think musically that was just a natural progression that jethro Tull were going that kind of way anyway um as you can hear from the sort of music that they made sort of directly after and 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 later um but yeah the, the concept and the, and the, the lyrics so that's written with tongue firmly in cheek yeah there were a lot of concept albums, and for instance, you picked Genesis, Selling England by the Pound, 
rather than Foxtrot, which has really one of my favorite progressive rock songs, Supper's Ready. The albums that I picked weren't the album, were on, on most, a lot of them aren't my favorite albums by those bands. They were ones that I've, I, you know, I thought long and hard on, which is the most important. Um, Supper's Ready, obviously, was the sort of gateway. It wasn't the first really long track. Lots of, you know, look at Caravan, Nine Feet Underground. It was, it was, you know, I, I think that I chose Selling England because it was the, the sound, the overall sound of the album has such a big impact, certainly on a lot of the bands that came later. Um, you know, uh, the second wave of progressive bands were hugely influenced by by the, the whole sound, which is something that the band had been working towards. You know, you can be, it's raw on um, nursery crime, and it, it, it it's a bit more developed on Foxtrot, but it seems to be the perfect package on Selling England by the Pound. And that's why I chose that particular album. And that's another good point, because we, we went through this period from the late 60s through the 70s, of such an improvement in recording technology and multi-tracking and all that that allowed musicians to create so much more in the studio than they could before. Oh, yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Take, look at technology in the 80s. I mean, it, we, we, we laugh and think it's redundant now, but it was the cutting edge at the time. And you listen back to some of those 80s, I mean, 80s especially, you listen back and you're like, oh, it's terrible. You know, give me the analog sound of the 70s any day. Yeah, but okay, don't don't forget that the early CDs, they weren't well recorded, they weren't mastered for CD, they used LP mastering on CDs. They didn't know how to master the digital technology at that time. I mean, digital came in in the late 70s in classical music and some, I think Billy Joel was one of the first sort of high-profile pop albums to, to use digital. And, and there was this whole period where they didn't master the technology. But the fact that they had the multi-tracking, you know, you look at that documentary footage of, of Pink Floyd recording Dark Side of the Moon with them in the studio, and some of the things that they were doing in the studio were truly revolutionary. And, and these are all taken for granted now. I can do them on my iMac. Yeah, I mean, you speak to Yes about how they were recording Close to the Edge, or Mike Oldfield when he was recording Tubular Bells, and they will tell you that there was reams and reams of tape stretching out all around the studio as you know and bits were being cut up and spliced back together and as you said that's all done on a computer you just move bits around um and and i think that that this adds to the mystique and the magic of those original albums because of the the extra effort the work that went in to actually having to create them and when you go back to some of those bands it's probably a lot easier today for a band to reproduce their studio sound live I'm just thinking, say, Yes and ELP back in the day, and even Genesis, they, of course, couldn't reproduce the sounds of Dark Side of the Moon or, or Close to the Edge Live, but they did a good job of it. They came pretty close. Yeah, I remember I remember hearing uh, a BBC recording of Dark Side of the Moon Live, on, um, and it was the first time that I ever heard uh, a live take of Dark Side of the Moon. Admittedly, it was on a car stereo, but, I mean, I was like, well, this sounds damn good. It, you know, it's it's not far. I mean, you look at um, you look at footage on YouTube of um, you know early Genesis uh, from about seventy three. Um, you know, there, there's a concert that just showed up. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. I think it was in Belgium, and someone restored the footage. It was from seventy three, and it's really quite impressive what they did. Yeah, and that's testament to the you know their their talent as individual musicians. You know, very pre prodigious musicianship, of course, is is the bedrock aggressive music um, and their incessant drive to make it as good as, as can be. Uh, yeah, I mean, talking about the prodigious music side of things, um, you know, there's, there's a few bands who, in, who came through cave in uh, a band I'm going to cite. They started out as a hardcore band. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this band, but then they, in the, at the end of the nineties and the early two thousands, and then they released an album called antenna and it sounded like rush. It was absolutely amazing. And I was working for Metal Hammer at the time. You know, obviously, I took took to the band, um, and and we write about them. And their PR, who happened to be Nirvana's PR as well in the UK, he'd be like, "Can you stop likening them to Rush, please? Because it's just not, you know." I'm like, "Well, they shouldn't sound like Rush." But when I interviewed them, I said, "What happened? You started out as a hardcore band. Now you're like, this, this is what we always wanted to do. We weren't good enough when we started out." There's it gives you an example of, you know. Uh, the Mars Volta said pretty much similar. We started as at the driving because we couldn't make the music we wanted to make. And when we got better, we could. So we became the Mars Volta. So, so you do talk about a lot of bands in your magazine, young bands, old bands. You see, as you said, the ones who re the reunions, either cynical or not, but all sorts of young bands. Where is prog rock going today? It, it seems to me, not being familiar with a lot of these bands, that it's going in 50 different directions. 
well, that that could be very. It could, you could see it that way, um, obviously, because we work with these bands. And that is, well, you could see it that way if you didn't know those bands. But you know, we work with a lot of these bands every day, so we kind of see what's what's happening. I mean, there's there's a lot of bad young bands I hear that now come through, and you hear a strong progressive influence, but you might not necessarily call them prog. I think what what you're seeing is young kids discovering music from their parents or siblings record collections couple that with the fact that the media over here actually are pretty okay with prog these days but they have been absolutely awful you know i mean they was if that you know they really thought they killed it off but the people who you know who fought the punk wars for the enemy and the melody maker They've moved on. They don't occupy positions in in media these days of of any kind of influence. So, you know, most people are like, well, actually, prog's not that bad. And there's there's certain areas of it that you know where it, it crosses into more sort of mainstream music that that's that's good. So you don't have that sort of stigma. Or you can't be prog. No one likes it. Kind of thing attitude. So you you combine these two factors and you hear a huge influence. Some of these bands move further into prog area and that's when we start to cover them but you can hear the influence uh in, in a lot more modern music look at a band called alt j who are a kind of pop band pop rock band but you listen to their latest album and you think well hang on half of this sounds like yes and that's a good thing i think for music as a whole progressive music um you know prog metal is always going to be there neo prog i think is always going to be there and they'll just carry on doing doing their thing it's it's the things that run in between i think i find interesting so to, to close can you give us three bands young bands new bands that people should listen to that 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 show a good range of what's going on in prog rock today yeah okay um i will cite a band called midas fall a female duo who sort of crossed the barrier from very melodic post-rock into progressive music. So that kind of give you a rough idea of where the sort of post-rock thing is, is mixing in with uh, uh, progressive music. Uh, I would then cite, um, I'm going to say Valis Ablaze, who are a young prog metal band, but they're not that heavy and there's no shouting vocals, which I know offends. And they're doing something I think that's quite, quite interesting. Um, and let me think, let's try and think of somebody really... Well, Ghost Community, um, who feature Matt Cohen, who was in The Reasoning and before that Magenta, and they're trying to do something different. They're bringing a little bit of a kind of a deep purple, heavy rock thing, but mixing it with a very sort of traditional neo-prog sound. Um, so you've got three different things there. You know, the post-rocky thing, the prog metal thing, and something that's perhaps a little more, not neo, but veering that way for people who like something along along those lines those so so midas fall ghost community and valis ablaze the three different sorts of bands who you know are sort of symbolic of of where music is kind of being made under the program umbrella today okay i'll have links in the show notes to their music um, on apple music presumably they're going to be there they're on all the streaming services because everyone is Jerry Ewing, thank you so much for joining us. The, your wonderful book is called Wondrous Stories. It's about the history of prog rock. And thanks for taking this time to talk to us. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I've had great fun chatting with you. Before we present our next tracks, I want to remind you that you can begin your free 30-day Audible trial and get your first audiobook free by visiting audibletrial.com slash next track. And we thank Audible.com for sponsoring this week's episode. All right, Kirk, you're up. This week I'll be listening to the new album by Brad Meldow called After Bach. I've mentioned Brad Meldow on the show a couple of times. He's my favorite jazz pianist playing today. He has a very broad approach to music. He plays his own compositions. He plays some jazz standards. He plays some interesting arrangements of popular songs, particularly Radiohead. And in this record, he presents a recording of some preludes and fugues by Johann Sebastian Bach, along with pieces that he composed that are influenced by them. As you listen to the record, you hear, for instance, the Bach's prelude number three in C-sharp major from the Well-Tempered Clavier, book one, and then the following piece is called After Bach Rondo. And you hear some of the themes in the Bach prelude 
but they're jazzified, they're transmogrified, they're twisted around. This record has five works by Bach, three preludes, a prelude and fugue, and then a fugue on its own. It also has seven works by Brad Meldow. One thing that I find a little bit annoying is I'm really familiar with the Bach music, and going from Meldow's jazz compositions to hearing Bach's preludes and fugues seems a bit jarring at times. So what I've been doing is I've been playing it in a playlist, just playing the Brad Meldow originals and not the Bach tunes. I know these Bach pieces almost by heart, and I can hear what Meldow is doing to the Bach in each of his pieces. So I don't need to keep hearing the Bach pieces over and over again. For people who aren't familiar with Bach's music, great to listen to both. But for me, I find it a little bit more interesting to just hear Brad Meldow stuff. Doug, what are you listening to this week? I've said a few times in the past that I'm still trying to catch up on old music, which is why I don't listen to a lot of new music. And I had a rare good experience with that. A lot of times I'll go back and hear something I hadn't uncovered before, and it turns out it would have been better to just leave it covered up. But have you ever heard of the Meters? They're a funky band out of New Orleans, and I've owned one or two of their albums over the years. You know, I've been aware of them and have always liked what I've heard, but I'm not that familiar with them. I don't know their history or their discography or anything like that. I vaguely know that they worked with other people like Dr. John and Alan Toussaint and Robert Palmer, but... One of their songs popped up on an internet radio station I was listening to, and I thought, gee, I wonder what their first album sounds like. So I went and dug it up. It sounds awesome. The Meters put out their first album, called The Meters, in 1969. There were four guys in the band at the time, bass, guitar, keyboards, and drums, and they just do these really cool, funk, New Orleans-infused instrumentals. Now, I don't know for sure, but I'd be willing to bet that a lot of licks from this album have been sampled over the years. The songs and the beats and the rhythms are very iconic. There's no doubt in my mind, in fact, that this sound influenced a lot of other people. I'm wondering if the Allman Brothers listened to this, or did Bruce Springsteen, or how about New Order? Because you can hear on this Meters album where maybe some of their rhythmic ideas might have come from. So I'm pretty happy, and I'm always very satisfied when I find albums like this, stuff that I'm, you know, kind of aware of but never really took the time to explore. It means that my musical curiosity is still stoked. And then I realize how it fits into my musical worldview and how it may have influenced other musicians that I like that came later. It's a eureka moment. The self-titled debut album from The Meters is my next track. This has been The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. You can find show notes and links to some of the things we talked about in this and other episodes at thenexttrack.com. There's also a contact form there you can use to send us comments. If you like the show, we hope you'll subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And please think about giving us a review or rating. We'd appreciate that. I'm Doug Adams, and for Kirk McElhern, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.